Good afternoon. Um, I feel very nervous, but very unequal to this task. Um, I'm very humbled at the prospect of standing here at this particular pulpit where I know so many wonderful church leaders have stood. See, it's already happening. Um, but I'm grateful for the opportunity to share with you some of the things that have been on my mind recently and that are very dear to my heart. Today is a special day for me. Uh, it's my wedding anniversary. I'm very blessed to have been married to this man sitting up here with me for eight years today. And since I've been asked to share a piece of this special day with you, I thought I would start out by telling you a little bit about him and about how we met, because uh, the story behind our meeting is what's going to lead me into the topic I've chosen to share today. Um, we met in October of 2009. Uh, I had just finished law school a couple years before this and had come back to Salt Lake and was working as an associate attorney downtown. I was having a very difficult time meeting nice young men to date. I was working as a personal injury attorney and criminal defense attorney at the time, mm -hmm. and as you can imagine, it's not really uh, very conducive to meeting nice young men to date. So uh, because I had just turned 31, I thought, okay, my chances are getting smaller and smaller by the minute. Uh, you guys don't know how lucky you are to be here at LDS Business College where you're surrounded by people that have the same standards as you. It's a wonderful thing. Um, out of desperation at that time, I turned to some online dating sites, LDS sites, mind you. But just because they were LDS sites didn't necessarily mean that everyone who had a profile was living the right lifestyle. I met some very interesting people. Uh, some very decent people, some of whom I still consider to be good friends. And I met some very um, indecent people. And since I don't want to get into the negative things, we'll just leave it there. Um, on a Saturday morning during this particularly uh, difficult period of my life, I was running some errands and ended up in what uh, I thought was a minor car accident. It turns out the damage to the cars was minor, but the damage to my spine was not. Um, now, sadly, the accident was my own fault, so there wasn't anyone I could sue to make me feel better, <laughs> at least financially. Uh, it was my own fault. But I ended up with a herniated disc in my neck. This uh, n disc had slipped out of place and was pinching my spinal cord and causing a lot of uh, numbness and pain in the left side of my body. Uh, I ended up in the ER a few days later getting an MRI and some, and some pain relief. Uh, I was in a lot of pain, a lot of pain at the time. and My family can tell you how awful it was. Um, but during the MRI that I had done in the emergency room, I had about 30 minutes to do nothing but stay still and breathe. That was all I was allowed to do during that time. And when, if any of you have ever been in an extreme amount of pain, you know how hard it is to hold still. So it was very difficult in that, in that machine. Um, so I decided to call on my Heavenly Father for some help. We often call on our Father in Heaven when we're experiencing pain or need a little extra boost, and so I figured this was as good a time as any to pray. I closed my eyes and I uttered one of the shortest but most heartfelt prayers of my entire life. I asked for strength to get through the procedure, and then I asked if he could to give me something to help me feel happy again. Just one little thing to help me smile. And that was it. That was all I asked for. I waited out the rest of the procedure. I got some medication, a lot of very heavy medication, and went home. The next day, I had a, a wonderful aunt who lived up the street from me call to check on me. And during this conversation, she asked if I wanted to go out with someone that she knew. He was the son of her mother's hairdresser. Now I'll give you just a minute to figure that out in your mind. Um, but my first reaction was no. Uh, my dating history at that point had not been the greatest, and the last thing I wanted was to uh, go out on another date, especially in my condition at that point. But by the end of our conversation, I felt prompted to change my mind. 
And so I agreed to go out with him on, only on the condition that uh, he wait until I was feeling better, because at this point I knew that surgery was probably on the horizon to fix my spine, and I, didn't, uh, I wasn't feeling up to starting anything uh, before then. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, Brian did not agree to those terms. Uh, he called me the very next morning and asked uh, for a time that we could work out to meet. And I figured, well, uh, I'll go ahead and meet him and then I can focus on healing and, and move on from there. So we agreed to meet a few days after that. Uh, unfortunately, the day that we were supposed to meet and go out uh, was not a good day for me. I was so sick from all the medications and the pain I was in that I had to call and ask him to postpone. He was very kind and very patient and agreed to wait a few more days before we could meet. Um, so I figured we would probably meet the next week. Well, the next day, he's not a patient man, if you can tell. <laughs> uh, I had just mustered up the strength to take a shower and was planning on lying down for a nap uh, when there was a knock at my door. Um, now I figured it was the same aunt that lived up the street coming to check on me, so I didn't really think about the fact that I had wet hair, no makeup on, and I was dressed in my sweatpants. Uh, when I opened the door, this incredible man was standing there with a bouquet of balloons, a get well card, a bag of chocolate, and a box of Tylenol. <laughs> it still overwhelms me. We hadn't even met, and already he was treating me better than any other person I'd ever gone out with. He brought these things by to let me know that he was thinking about me and he hoped I would feel better soon so that we could meet properly and get to know each other. It was definitely something that made me feel happy and made me smile. I immediately knew that there was something to this person and I couldn't wait to get to know him better. Then I looked down at myself and realized what I looked like and I thought, oh no, he's not coming back now. <laughs> But he did come back, and we uh, had, our, had our first date a couple days after that and had our second date planned within the first 10 minutes of our first date, and the rest is in the books. We had a wonderful time getting to know each other and dating, and we got married in May, on May 22, 2010. And we now have a very rambunctious six-year-old boy named Tyler, and I am very blessed to get to be a stepmom to his 13-year-old uh, son, Nate, who is a wonderful young man. I'm very grateful for my family. But I shared the story of how Brian and I met with you to demonstrate the incredible power of prayer. That simple and humble prayer that I said in the MRI machine brought about the most incredible and miraculous blessings for me. That small prayer changed my life. Within one week of that prayer, I had met the love of my life and my eternal companion, and from there was able to start my family. And I am so grateful. In the October 2016 General Conference, Sister Carol McConkie said, Prayer is essential to developing faith. We are children of a loving Heavenly Father, and we have the opportunity to enjoy personal communion with Him when we pray with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ. Further, we must act in accordance with the answers we receive by the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Sister McConkie went on to describe that prayer involves all three members of the Godhead, something that I hadn't really thought about before I had heard that talk. But we pray to our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ, and we receive answers to those prayers through the Holy Ghost. We pray to our Heavenly Father because He's the one who has the power and the ability to grant us our most sincere desires. On the topic of prayer, the Bible Dictionary states that as soon as we learn the true relationship in which we stand towards God, namely that He is our Father and we are His children, prayer becomes natural and instinctive on our part. Many of the difficulties about prayer arise from the fact that we forget that relationship. Prayer is the act by which the will of the Father and the will of the child are brought into correspondence with each other. Prayer is a form of work and is an appointed means for obtaining the highest of all blessings. Building our relationship with our Heavenly Father begins with prayer, and like any meaningful relationship, requires sincere effort. Whether our prayers are said out loud or conveyed silently, 
Through the mind and heart, they present opportunities for us to communicate directly with our divine creator. He hears and answers our prayers, sometimes in very obvious ways, and sometimes through impressions, promptings, and feelings of peace. And sometimes he delivers nice-looking young men to your porch bearing gifts. <laughs> our prayers become much more meaningful when our relationship with our Father in Heaven develops. I am very grateful that my parents are here today uh, and my in-laws. I'm lucky that uh, we are able to live close to them and that we have strong relationships with one another. I talk to one or both of my parents every single day. I don't think a day goes by that I don't speak to at least one of them. Now that I'm a mother, I understand what it means to want to communicate with your child as often as possible. I understand what it means to love your child and want to know that they are okay. I know that our Heavenly Father loves us more than we can imagine. He is our Father. He created us individually in His image, and He allowed us to come to Earth to gain a body and experience so that we can become part of His eternal plan of salvation and continue His work here on Earth. Uh, I believe that He aches as a parent would ache when there's no communication. The effort of communicating with Him must be on our part and it is absolutely necessary for us. He has proclaimed that He will always be near and He will always answer our prayers. We simply have to pray. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He will be the one to stand by us, to defend us when necessary, and to plead our cause when it is our turn to stand before our Father in Heaven. Over the years, I have drafted a lot of legal documents, both as a paralegal and as a practicing attorney. The first part of every legal document introduces the party who's filing the document, followed by the fact that he is doing it by and through his representative or his attorney of record. Attorneys then communicate with the courts and represent their client's interests and desires to the court in the hopes that the court will side with their client. Our Savior acts very much the same way. Uh, we seek answers and things from our Heavenly Father, and we do so through that representative, in the name of Jesus Christ. Sister McConkie said, quote, This representative suffered, bled, and died to glorify his Father, and his merciful petition on our behalf opens the way for each of us to obtain peace in this life and everlasting life in the world to come. He does not want us to suffer longer or endure more trials than needed. He does, want, he does want us to turn to Him and allow Him to ease our burdens, to heal our hearts, and to cleanse our souls through His purifying power." Close quote. I don't know about the rest of you, but I find incredible comfort in knowing that my sins have already been atoned for. They have already been washed away. I simply have to repent, but I will have that advocate to argue on my behalf when it is time to face my Heavenly Father. Uh, I'm grateful to be able to pray in His sacred name and to use Him as my advocate when the time comes to pray. Finally, Sister McConkie said that we pray and receive answers to our prayers through the power of the Holy Ghost. When we pray with faith, the Holy Ghost can guide our thoughts so that our words harmonize with the will of God. She said, quote, It is not only important that we shall know how to pray, but it is equally important that we shall know how to receive the answer to our prayer, to be discerning, to be alert, to be able to see with clear vision and understand with clear intention God's will and purpose concerning us." Close quote. In the Doctrine and Covenants section 9, verses 8 and 9, the Lord is speaking to Oliver Cowdery and said, But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind, then you must ask me if it be right, and if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. But if it be not right, you shall have no such feeling, but you shall have a stupor of thought that shall cause you to forget the thing which is wrong. We must be prepared to receive answers to our prayers through the still small voice of the Holy Ghost, to be in tune with the Holy Ghost enough to recognize which answers we are receiving. Sometimes we don't get the answers that we want to our heartfelt prayers. Sometimes we have to wait a very long time to receive the blessings that we've been seeking. 
but we have to be prepared to submit ourselves to the will of our Father in heaven when we seek these answers to our prayers. Jesus Christ was the perfect example of this. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was in agony, sweating as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. He prayed, saying, Father, if it be thy will, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was truly willing to accept our Heavenly Father's answer to his prayer, no matter what the outcome was. The object of prayer is not to change the will of God, but to secure for ourselves and for others blessings that God is already willing to grant us, but are made conditional upon our asking for them. This can be the most difficult part of praying. Do we really pray for his will to be done? Are we really willing to graciously accept answers when they are not what we want? I once received an answer to a prayer that I didn't want. After I had received my bachelor's degree from the University of Utah, I was working as a paralegal, and I loved my job. I didn't have any debt from school. I thought my schooling was finished. I had my degree, and I was working a great job, and I was happy. And You guys will get there, too, I promise. Um, I just wanted to continue. My boss at the time encouraged me to start preparing for the LSAT and to look into law school applications. I told him he was crazy. It was not something I was going to do. Um, but he continued to bug me about it for quite a while. So after a couple of years of fighting with him, we had a good relationship so we could fight about a lot of things. Um, I decided to go ahead and take the LSAT. I figured I probably wouldn't get a good enough score to, to move forward and the whole conversation would just end there. So I took it and I got my score back and I thought, oh no. It was a good enough score to get in at least to a few schools. So I thought, oh boy. So then it was time to look into the application process and I thought, well, I'll fill these out but no school is going to take me. I'm, I'm not smart enough or capable enough to handle law school. I, um, and the conversation will end there. Well, I got into a few schools and I really thought, oh no, now I have to make a decision. Um, keep in mind, this was not something I wanted. It was never a desire of mine to go to law school, to practice law. I loved being a paralegal. It was um, such a great job. And so I didn't want to attend law school. I didn't want to practice law. I didn't want to spend three years, another three years in school, in very hard school. Uh, I didn't want to borrow money to pay for these three additional years. I didn't want to move away. I just wanted to continue in life the way it was. Um, but I knew I needed to be prayerful when I made the decision. My patriarchal blessing reminds me that when making big decisions in life, to seek the guidance of the Spirit as well as my parents. So I went to my parents and I asked my dad for a priesthood blessing still hoping the answer would be, of course, that I didn't have to go. Before the blessing, I prayed for the ability uh, to understand what that answer would be, to recognize the answer. And I knew that whatever answer I got, I made a promise that whatever the answer was, I would do it. As soon as my dad put his hands on my head, I received an impression it was that fast. I won't go into the details of that impression for the sake of time, but there was no doubt in my mind that I had received an answer to my prayer. I had to go to law school. So when my dad finished his blessing, I looked up at my mom with tear-filled eyes, much like they are right now, and I said, I guess I'm going. And she looked back at me, and I think she, was, she might have even been more devastated than I was that I had to go to law school. Um, looking back, I think it's funny that the answer I didn't want came very, very quickly when the answer to a prayer that I had been praying for for a very long time took well over a decade to get. I do know that our Heavenly Father has a sense of humor. Um, but receiving an answer to a prayer that I didn't want was very hard. I prayed for a long time to understand the reason why that was his answer. I never asked Heavenly Father to change his mind or to change his answer, but I did pray to know why, and eventually that answer came as well. I now know why I had to do it. 
but at the time I didn't. I went completely on faith, knowing that it was what my Heavenly Father wanted me to do. I asked for an answer to a prayer, and I got it. From there, it was my responsibility to accept that answer that I was given and abide by it. It was the most difficult thing I'd ever done. It was the hardest three years of my life, but it was also the best three years of my life to that point. I am grateful for that experience looking back. I'm grateful for a very loving Heavenly Father who knows me better than I know myself, one who knows my potential better than I do and that knows what's best for me. I'm grateful for the gift of the Holy Ghost and for the ability to receive answers to prayers through the Holy Ghost. I almost didn't meet Brian. He was a direct answer to a prayer, and I'm grateful for the prompting of the Holy Ghost for me to change my mind because my aunt was perfectly ready to line him up with someone else if I said no. Uh, but I'm grateful that I changed my mind, that I was prompted to change my mind. And I'm grateful for the promptings of the Holy Ghost when I was trying to decide my future with respect to schooling. I, knew this, uh, I know that the Spirit knew I would need a very clear and direct answer in, in order to accept it. Prayer is an incredible tool. Without it, there is no way to communicate with our Heavenly Father directly. I know He hears every single prayer that is uttered. I don't know how, but He does. He has answered every single one of my prayers when I needed an answer. Sometimes it took longer than others, but He has answered every single prayer. He has blessed me in ways that I still can't believe. I encourage you all to fill your days with prayer. Don't just pray morning and night or when it's time to have a meal. Be, be in communication with our Heavenly Father constantly. Fill your thoughts with prayer. When you're walking to and from devotional, say, have a prayer in your heart that you will feel the Spirit, that you will learn something about yourself. When you're heading to class in the ever-so-crowded elevators that we all love, say a silent prayer in your heart that the things that you have studied and prepared for class will be brought to mind and that you will be able to understand and apply the things that you've learned. When your instructors ask for volunteers to pray in the classroom, take, take advantage and take the opportunity to communicate with your Heavenly Father because it's a privilege to do so. Uh, make a conscious effort to take an extra few minutes each morning to thank Heavenly Father for that new day, for the opportunities that lie ahead. I know how busy mornings can be, especially when you have more than just yourself to get out the door, but it's so important that we take a few minutes to begin our day with, by communicating with our Father in Heaven. He loves us. He loves you. Please remember how much He loves you. He wants to hear from you. I know He loves me. And I know he answers my prayers. I testify that my life would be so very different if I didn't pray. I'm grateful to work in a place where we begin classes and meetings with prayer, that we're able to invite the Spirit into everything that we do and ask it to guide everything that we do. I'm grateful to be a teacher. I'm grateful that not only am I allowed to, but I'm encouraged to discuss gospel principles in the classroom. I'm grateful for my family. I don't think anyone could doubt that I love my family. I'm very blessed. I could talk about them for days, but don't worry, I won't. I just know how much I love and admire them. My parents, my in-laws, my siblings and their spouses, my wonderful husband and my sons. My heart is very full. My testimony of this gospel is so strong. I want you all to know that I have a testimony of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm grateful for Him, for His atoning sacrifice, for His teachings, and for His example. I'm grateful that I get to use His name when I pray. And I'm grateful for my testimony of prayer. It is something very dear to me. And I'm grateful that I could share that testimony with you today. And I leave these things with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.